Today we undervolt and overclock the Ryzen 5 9600X processor all the way up to 5818 MHz. For that I will use a synchronous e-clock and of course I also need to use Curve Shaper. In this video I break down the Ryzen 5 9600X tuning process into four unique overclocking strategies for beginners and advanced overclockers. However, before we jump into the overclocking, let's first have a look at the benchmarks and the hardware that we'll be using in this guide. The AMD Ryzen 5 9600X is part of AMD's Zen 5 based Ryzen 9000 desktop processor product line, codenamed Granite Ridge. The Granite Ridge processors were introduced on June 2nd, 2024, during Computex 2024. The Ryzen 5 9600X succeeds the 6-core Zen 4 Ryzen 7 7600X, which we overclocked to 5.55 GHz in Scatterventure number 48. It has a base clock of 3.9 GHz and a listed boost frequency of up to 5.4 GHz. Unlike its predecessor, the TDP is capped at 65 watts. The system we're overclocking today consists of the following hardware. We use Windows 11 and the following benchmark applications to measure performance and ensure system stability. Before we start overclocking, of course we have to check the performance at default settings. The default precision boost 2 parameters for the Ryzen 5 9600X are as follows. Here's the benchmark performance at stock. Here are the 3 dmark CPU profile scores at stock. Here's the ADA64 memory benchmark scores at stock. When running the OCCT CPU AVX2 stability test, the average CPU core effective clock is 4655 MHz with 1.030 volts. The average CPU temperature is 67.4 degrees Celsius. The average CPU package power is 87.8 watts. When running the OCCT CPU SSE stability test, the average CPU core effective clock is 4938 MHz with 1.109 volts. The average CPU temperature is 67.1 degrees Celsius. The average CPU package power is 87.8 watts. Of course we can increase the power limits by using precision boost overdrive and that's exactly what we'll do in the very first overclocking strategy. However, before that make sure to locate the clear CMOS button. Pressing the clear CMOS button will reset all your BIOS settings to default, which is helpful if you want to start your BIOS configuration from scratch. In our first overclocking strategy, we simply take advantage of Precision Boost Overdrive and AMD Expo. With the launch of Zen 5, AMD introduced an improved version of their Precision Boost Overdrive Overclockers Toolkit. The PBO Toolkit essentially allows us to fine tune the parameters that govern the Precision Boost algorithm. The Precision Boost Overdrive 2 toolkit for Zen 5 Ryzen processors includes the overclocking knobs from Zen Plus, PPT, TDC and EDC, Zen 2, Boost Override and Scaler, Zen 3, Curve Optimizer, and the newly announced Curve Shaper for Zen 5. There are essentially three levels of Precision Boost Overdrive. In this overclocking strategy, we're simply enabling Precision Boost Overdrive. In next strategies, we'll also dig into tuning the parameters. By enabling Precision Boost Overdrive, we rely on the motherboard pre-programmed PBO parameters. We find that the following values have changed. Increasing the PPT and, to a lesser extent, the TDC and EDC limit will help unleash the frequency and multi-threaded workloads previously limited by the PPT. EXPO stands for AMD Extended Profiles for Overclocking. It's an AMD technology that enables ubiquitous memory overclocking for AMD platforms supporting DDR5 memory. EXPO allows memory vendors such as G-Skill to program higher performance settings onto the memory sticks. If the motherboard supports EXPO, you can enable higher performance with a single BIOS setting. So it saves you from lots of manual configuration. Upon entering the BIOS, go to the Extreme Tweaker menu. Set AI Overclock Tuner to Expo 2. Enter the Precision Boost Overdrive submenu. 
set Precision Boost Overdrive to Enabled, then save and exit the BIOS. We reran the benchmarks and checked the performance increase compared to the default operation. Despite the Ryzen 5 9600X having only 6 Zen 5 cores, the performance is constrained by its maximum power limit of 65 Watt. By enabling PBO, we can easily double the power budget in all core workloads. Combining that with enabling higher memory speeds and it translates into significant performance gains across the board. The Geomean benchmark performance improvement is plus 3.13% and we get a maximum improvement of plus 14.87% in UI Prime. When running the OCCT CPU AVX2 stability test, the average CPU core effective clock is 5090 MHz with 1.187 volts. The average CPU temperature is 94.7 degrees Celsius. The average CPU package power is 128.4 watts. When running the OCCT CPU SSE stability test, the average CPU core effective clock is 5,209 MHz with 1.275 volts. The average CPU temperature is 93.9 .9 degrees Celsius. The average CPU package power is 138.6 watts. The boost frequency with one active thread is about 5,447 MHz and the average boost frequency gradually trails off to 5,204 MHz when all cores are active. All cores can boost to over 5.4 GHz in single threaded workloads. In our second overclocking strategy, we fine-tune the parameters that govern the precision boost boosting algorithm to both overclock and undervolt at the same time. Fused maximum frequency, or Fmax, is one of the key limiters of the precision boost algorithm. Basically, the Fmax defines the maximum allowed frequency for every of the core inside your CPU. Boost clock override, or Fmax override, is one of the tools available in the PBO2 overclockers toolkit. It allows the user to override the arbitrary clock frequency limit between minus 1000 MHz and plus 200 MHz in steps of 25 MHz. It's important to note that the Fmax override only adjusts the upper ceiling of the frequency and doesn't act as a frequency offset. Ultimately, the Precision Boost 2 algorithm still determines the actual operating frequency. The programmed Fmax of the Ryzen 5 9600X is 5450 MHz. So, with a plus 200 Fmax boost override, the new maximum boost frequency is 5650 MHz. Scalar is a tool that allows us to override the warranted silicon stress level, or FIT. We can override the warranted level up to 10x. While the tool offers precise granularity, Typically, you'll find the available options to range between 1x and 10x in steps of one multiple. The effect of increasing scalar is that the precision boost algorithm will pursue higher voltages more aggressively. The impact of scalar can vary architecture to architecture because it's just one of the parameters that govern the maximum allowed voltage. For the Zen 5 Granite Ridge processors, it appears Scalar is making a comeback in the overclocking strategies because the chips are very voltage limited. The programmed VID limit is 1.4 volt, though we can see slight excursions above that in really light single threaded workloads. When all six cores are active, the maximum voltage is 1.35 volts. With a 10x Scalar, the maximum voltage increased from 1.35 to 1.375 volt. That's not a big increase, but in voltage-constrained scenarios, every little bit helps. Curve Optimizer is one of the most important tools for AMD Ryzen CPU overclockers. It's most commonly known for its undervolting capabilities, but on AMD Ryzen CPUs, it kind of also works as an overclocking tool. Let me explain. Simply put, a voltage frequency curve describes the relationship between an operating frequency and the voltage required to operate at that frequency. Here's the default voltage frequency curve of my Ryzen 5 9600X processor. We can immediately make a simple and redundant observation. The higher the frequency, the more voltage is required. For example, we only need 
one volt for a frequency of 4950 megahertz however we need over 1.3 volt for a frequency of more than 5.4 gigahertz we also notice that the maximum allowed voltage is 1.35 volt when all cores are active we can increase this to 1.375 volt by setting a 10x scalar. The Precision Boost 2 algorithm utilizes the VF curve to find what's the maximum possible frequency at 1.375 volt. With the default curve, that's about 5450 megahertz. However, as I showed a little earlier, we can use the Fmax Boost Override tool to increase the Fmax by another 200 megahertz. If we set a curve optimizer to negative 30, we can shift the entire voltage frequency curve along the voltage axis, and suddenly we need a lot less voltage for every operating frequency. For example, for 5 GHz, we needed about 1.117 volt by default, but with a minus 30 curve optimizer, now we only need 1.021 volt. Moreover, the frequency is also boosting higher. The highest frequency with all six cores active has increased by 120 MHz to almost 5650 MHz. These higher frequencies are now possible because our curve optimizer undervolting pulled them below the 1.375 volt threshold. Curve optimizer is a powerful tuning tool. It's simple but not simplistic. And the more you dig into the details on how it works, the more intricate it becomes to figure out how to apply it in a daily overclock. Overclockers most commonly use curve optimizer by setting a negative value, by setting a negative curve optimizer. Two things happen when you do that. First, undervolting lowers the operating voltage, temperature and power consumption. Second, as a consequence, the Precision Boost 2 algorithm can leverage the additional headroom to boost to higher frequencies. So you tend to get lower temperatures and higher frequencies it's a win-win situation. However, there are a couple of caveats to tuning with Curve Optimizer. Curve Optimizer impacts the entire voltage frequency curve, so it affects stability across the entire range of operating frequencies, from 600 to 6000 MHz. And the same Curve Optimizer value also impacts differently across the curve. If you're lucky, then your CPU's undervolt margin across the curve matches how Curve Optimizer offsets the voltage across the curve, because in that case, you'll be able to quite easily squeeze a lot more performance out of your CPU. But if you're unlucky and one part of your CPU's VF curve doesn't have that much margin, then tuning with Curve Optimizer can be quite a rough time. Curve Optimizer is available on a per CPU, per CCD and per core basis. The manual tuning process with Curve Optimizer can become quite convoluted because it spans a very wide range of applications, going from light, single-threaded workloads all the way to heavy, all-core workloads. The easiest way to approach Curve Optimizing is by trying to find the weak spot of the curve. That can vary between architectures and even chips. In my case, I found that the Y Cruncher BKT workload was always the first to fail when undervolting with Curve Optimizer. BKT is a relatively light workload as it runs integer operations on all cores. This pushes the effective clock quite high up the VF curve and stress tests high operating frequencies. With this CPU, I could set an all core curve optimizer of minus 35. Upon entering the BIOS, Go to the Extreme Tweaker menu. Set AI Overclock Tuner to Expo 2. Switch to the Advanced menu. Enter the AMD Overclocking submenu and click Accept. Enter the Precision Boost Overdrive submenu. Set Precision Boost Overdrive to Advanced. Set PBO Limits to Motherboard. Set Precision Boost Overdrive Scalar Control to Manual. Set Precision Boost Overdrive Scalar to 10x. Set CPU Boost Clock Override to Enabled Positive. Set Max CPU Boost Clock Override to 200. Enter the Curve Optimizer submenu. Set Curve Optimizer to All Cores. Set All Core Curve Optimizer Sign to Negative. Set All Core Curve Optimizer Magnitude to 35. Then save and exit the BIOS. We reran the benchmarks and check the performance increase compared to the default operation. Curve Optimizer and FMAX Boost Override are powerful tools to add performance to a Ryzen processor. 
With a minimal amount of work, we've improved the performance quite significantly across the board. The GeoMean performance improvement is plus 4.74%, and we get a maximum improvement of plus 15.44% in PY Prime. When running the OCCT CPU AVX2 stability test, the average CPU core effective clock is 5,293 MHz with 1.169 volts. The average CPU temperature is 95.2 degrees Celsius. The average CPU package power is 133.2 watts. When running the OCCT CPU SSE stability test, the average CPU core effective clock is 5,405 MHz with 1.253 volts. The average CPU temperature is 95.3 degrees Celsius. The average CPU package power is 132.6 watts. The boost frequency at one active thread is about 5,649 MHz, and the average boost frequency gradually trails off to 5,420 MHz when all cores are active. All six cores can boost to over 5.65 GHz in single threaded workloads. In our third overclocking strategy, we will dig into optimizing the memory subsystem performance. Now on AMD Granite Ridge CPUs, the memory subsystem consists of three major parts, the fabric, the memory controller, and the system memory. They're more commonly referred to as the F-clock, the U-clock, and the M-clock. First generation Ryzen overclockers know that these parts used to be tightly coupled together, but on modern Ryzen processors like the Ryzen 5 9600X, we can tune them independently. There were three things I wanted to address with the memory subsystem performance optimization. The fabric frequency or F-clock is generated by the SOC PLL derived from a 100 MHz reference clock input. The reference clock is multiplied by the F-clock ratio, which you can configure in the BIOS. The standard operating frequency of the Infinity Fabric is 1800 MHz, but on many boards you'll find it runs 2100 MHz when Precision Boost Overdrive is enabled. There doesn't seem to be that much headroom for the Infinity Fabric. I was able to increase it to 2200 MHz, up from 2100 MHz, but anything above that basically didn't boot, not even with voltage adjustments. Speaking of the voltage, the Infinity Fabric voltage is provided by the VDDG voltage supply, derived via an integrated voltage regulator from the VDDCR miscellaneous voltage rail. There's a total of two VDDG voltage rails available for manual adjustment. AMD Granite Ridge has two DDR5 Unified Memory Controllers, or UMC in short, and each provides two 32-bit memory channels. The memory controllers are inside the I.O. die and are identical to the memory controllers of the Ryzen 7000 Rafale processors. Note that the Ryzen 8000 Hawkpoint processors actually have a newer memory controller. The unified memory controller frequency, or U-clock, is derived from the UMC clock, one of the SLC PLLs. The UMC clock is driven by a 100 MHz reference clock derived from either an internal or external clock generator. The memory controller frequency is tied directly to the system memory frequency. It can run either at the same or half its frequency. At default, the memory controller runs at the same frequency as the system memory at 2400 MHz. However, we find that by enabling Expo, often the motherboard auto rules will drop the memory controller frequency to half of the system memory frequency. We can easily force the memory controller to run at the same frequency as the system memory by setting uclock div1 mode to uclock equals memclock. I also suggest enabling SOC Uncore OC mode to disable all power saving technologies affecting the clock frequencies of the memory subsystem. The VDDCR SOC voltage rail provides the external power for multiple internal voltage regulators on a SOC for various IP blocks, including the memory controller. The VDDIO MEM voltage rail is related as it provides the external power for the VDDP DDR5 bus signaling. The last piece of memory subsystem performance optimization is of course checking the memory subtimings. Now for this I rely in part on the ACES memory presets and in part on what I've learned in previous scatter venture guides. 
ACES Memory Presets is an ACES overclocking technology that provides a selection of memory tuning presets for specific memory ICs. The presets will adjust the memory timings and voltages. The ROG Crosshair X670E Hero motherboard sports 14 memory profiles for a variety of memory ICs and configurations. Since we're interested in simply adjusting the memory timings, we can try the Hynix 6400 1.4V 2x16GB single rank preset. Note that I stick with the Expo primary timings and only leverage the memory preset for the secondary and tertiary subtimings. Regular viewers will know that I've used this very specific memory kit in previous Hawkpoint and Granite Ridge overclocking guides. And in those guides, the kit wasn't exactly 100% stable using just the memory preset. That's also the case for this system as the kit is stable at DDR5 6400 to pass the benchmarks, but not stable to pass the OCCT memory stability test. However, we pass the OCCT memory stability test by reducing the memory frequency by one notch to DDR5-6200. Note that we still rely on the Expo profile for the voltage configuration and the primary timings, and we still rely on the ACES memory preset for the subtiming configuration. After the tuning, our ADA64 performance improves quite significantly. We got about plus 20% extra performance by enabling Expo and added another 15% on top of that by tuning the memory timings. Upon entering the BIOS, go to the Extreme Tweaker menu. Set AI Overclock Tuner to Expo 2. Set Memory Frequency to DDR5-6200. Enter the DRAM Timings Control submenu. Enter the Memory Presets submenu. Select Load Hynix 6400MHz 1.4V 2x16GB single rank and click OK. Leave the memory presets submenu. Set TCL, TR, CCD and TRS according to the Expo kit. Set TRS to 38. Leave the DRAM timing control submenu. Switch to the advanced menu. Enter the AMD overclocking submenu and click accept. Enter the DDR and Infinity Fabric frequency timings submenu. Enter the Infinity Fabric Frequency and Dividers submenu. Set Infinity Fabric Frequency and Dividers to 2200 MHz. Set UClock Div 1 mode to UClock equals MemClock. Leave the Infinity Fabric Frequency and Dividers submenu. Leave the DDR and Infinity Fabric Frequency Timings submenu. Enter the Precision Boost Overdrive submenu. Set Precision Boost Overdrive to Advanced. Set PBO Limits to Motherboard. Set Precision Boost Overdrive Scalar Control to Manual. Set Precision Boost Overdrive Scalar to 10x. Set CPU Boost Clock Override to Enabled Positive. Set Max CPU Boost Clock Override to 200. Enter the Curve Optimizer submenu. Set Curve Optimizer to All Cores. Set All Core Curve Optimizer Sign to Negative. Set All Core Curve Optimizer Magnitude to 35. Leave the Curve Optimizer submenu. Leave the Precision Boost Overdrive submenu. Enter the SOC Uncore OC mode submenu. Set SOC Uncore OC mode to Enabled. Leave the SOC Uncore OC mode submenu. Enter the SOC Voltage submenu. Set SOC Voltage to 1300, then save and exit the BIOS. We reran the benchmarks and checked the performance increase compared to the default operation. Tuning the memory subsystem has a surprisingly large impact on the benchmark performance. The standout performance improvement is of course PY Prime, where we see a maximum improvement of plus 39.61% over stock, but that's very much a memory benchmark. However, we also see a performance uplift of 5 to 7 percentage points in other multi-threaded benchmarks such as Geekbench and AI Benchmark. The GeoMean performance improvement is plus 6.49%. In our fourth and final overclocking strategy, we make use of a synchronous E-clock. E-clock stands for external clock, and it is exactly what the term suggests. We can use an external clock generator. And using that external clock generator, we can warp the precision boost VF curve to achieve higher frequencies. The standard Granite Ridge platform has a 48 MHz crystal input to the integrated CG PLL clock generator. 
The CG PLL then generates a 48 MHz clock for the USB PLL and a 100 MHz reference clock for the FCH, which contains the CCLK PLL for the CPU cores and several SLC PLLs. The external clocks are inputs to the FCH. There you can configure how you want to use the external clocks. In eClock Zero mode, an external 100 MHz reference clock is used for both the CPU and SLC PLLs. In other words, it's a reference clock that affects the CPU core clocks as well as the PCIe and SATA clocks. In eClock 1 mode, there are two distinct external 100 MHz reference clocks. One clock provides the 100 MHz input for the CPU PLL, and another provides the 100 MHz reference clock for the SLC PLLs. The overclocking strategy with a synchronous eClock is the polar opposite of what we usually do when we try to overclock Ryzen CPUs. A very typical Ryzen CPU overclocking approach is to use a negative curve optimizer. And by applying a negative curve optimizer, we undervolt the CPUs and drag it along the voltage axis. So with lower volt, you get higher frequencies. With a synchronous eClock, we still rely on that default VF curve, but rather than undervolting, we actually increase the frequency of every VF point. So we apply a linear stretch on our non-linear curve. And that can cause a little bit of a problem. Let me explain. Here you can see two VF curves of this Ryzen 5 9600X, the default curve and the one from OC strategy number two with the minus 35 curve optimizer. We can see the law of diminishing marginal returns. The higher the frequency, the less additional frequency for every step of additional voltage. For example, on the default curve, increasing the voltage from 1.1 volt to 1.2 volt gives an extra 250 megahertz, but increasing from 1.2 volt to 1.3 volt only gives an extra 150 megahertz. The law of diminishing returns also applies to our undervolt. With a minus 35 curve optimizer, we get an extra 350 megahertz at 1.1 volt but only plus 250 megahertz at 1.3 volt. If we increase the e-clock by 5.5%, setting it to 105.5 megahertz, then the resulting curve looks as follows. We can see that the frequency increases by about 250 to 300 megahertz across the entire curve, and it doesn't show any diminishing returns. Au contraire, we get more additional frequency the further up the curve we go. However, compared to our curve optimized curve, we find that while we have higher frequencies at the upper end of the curve, we're using more voltage at the lower end of the curve. The consequence in the real world is that despite adding top frequency for single threaded applications, we might be sacrificing all round frequency in all core workloads. Before Ryzen 9000, we could also use a synchronous e-clock. But in order to support the higher frequencies at the upper end of the curve, we had to use a positive curve optimizer to essentially overvolt. And that would sacrifice frequency at the lower end of the curve. But with Ryzen 9000 CPUs, we have a new tool in our Precision Boost Overdrive toolbox, Curve Shaper. Curve Shaper is the newly announced overclocking tool of the Precision Boost Overdrive toolkit. It was introduced alongside the Ryzen 9000 CPUs earlier this year, and I already had an in-depth look at how the feature works in a different video on this channel. In theory, it seems Curve Shaper is pretty straightforward. You get 15 additional tunable points across the VF curve. But the devil is in the details because AMD's Precision Boost 2 technology doesn't really work with VF points. So instead of getting a list of specific tunable VF points, we get five regions and three temperatures. The regions have a bit of a vague terminology and are not really clearly defined. I'll get back to that in a minute. The temperature points are more straightforward as they're defined as minus 5, 50 and 90 degrees Celsius. The idea behind Curve Shaper is that you can adjust the voltage frequency curve in specific parts of the curve. That's unlike Curve Optimizer, which applies across the entire curve. So you could, for example, say that you only want to undervolt for high frequencies between 50 and 90 degrees Celsius, which would be kind of a typical um, idea for, for example, gaming workloads. In our case, 
we want to achieve two things. First, something I didn't mention earlier, but with the 105.5 MHz e-clock, our CPU wasn't stable in the Y-Cruncher VKT workload. For this purpose, we can use the high frequency shaper point and apply a positive shaper magnitude. When we set the value to plus 10, the voltage at 5.6 GHz increases from 1.25 volt to 1.291 volts. Second, we want to claw back the undervolting potential at the lower end of the voltage frequency curve. For this purpose, we can use the low frequency shaper point and apply a negative shaper magnitude. When we set the value to minus 30, the curve looks as follows. Thanks to the different curve shaper points, we've successfully returned to our aggressive undervolt in the lower regions of the VF curve. However, we maintain the voltage at the upper end of the VF curve to ensure stability at the highest frequencies. This is a perfect illustration of the strength of curve shaper. Side note, it does seem like there is a couple of minor bugs with the implementation of curve shaper, and I think it's because there's no GAR bands protecting us from setting illegal values. An illegal value would essentially be when we try to apply a voltage for a certain frequency that's lower than the voltage for a lower frequency. But I think those issues will be ironed out in the future. This is neither the time nor the place to discuss this in great detail. Just know that I manually set the maximum frequency shaper point to plus 30 to work around some of these issues. The manual tuning process with a synchronous e-clock can become quite convoluted because it spans a wide range of applications, going all the way from light single-threaded workloads up to heavy all-core workloads. The process that I followed with my Ryzen 5 9600X is as follows. As usual, the requirement for stability is that we pass all benchmarks and all CCT stability tests. This configuration gives me a theoretical maximum frequency of 5961 MHz. However, we are still limited by the voltage, so ultimately the maximum idle frequency is 5818 MHz and the maximum all-core frequency in a light workload is about 5.7 GHz. Upon entering the BIOS, go to the Extreme Tweaker menu. Set AI Overclock Tuner to Expo 2. Set E-Clock Mode to Asynchronous Mode. Set BCLK2 frequency to 105.50. Set memory frequency to DDR5-6200. Enter the DRAM timing control submenu. Enter the memory presets submenu. Select load Hynix 6400MHz 1.4V 2x16GB single rank and click OK. Leave the memory presets submenu. Set TCL, TRCCD and TRAS according to the Expo kit. Set TRAS to 38. Leave the DRAM timing control submenu. Switch to the advanced menu. Enter the AMD overclocking submenu and click accept. Enter the DDR and Infinity Fabric Frequency Timings submenu. Enter the Infinity Fabric Frequency and Dividers submenu. Set Infinity Fabric Frequency and Dividers to 2200 MHz. Set UClock Div 1 mode to UClock equals MemClock. Leave the Infinity Fabric Frequency and Dividers submenu. Leave the DDR and Infinity Fabric Frequency Timings submenu. Enter the Precision Boost Overdrive submenu. Set Precision Boost Overdrive to Advanced. Set PBO Limits to Motherboard. Set Precision Boost Overdrive Scalar Control to Manual. Set Precision Boost Overdrive Scalar to 10x. Set CPU Boost Clock Override to Enabled Positive. Set Max CPU Boost Clock Override to 200. Enter the Curve Shaper submenu. For Low, High and Max Frequency, set Low, Medium and High Temperature to Enable. For Low Frequency, set All Temperature Signs to Negative. For High and Max Frequency, set All Temperature Signs to Positive. For Low Frequency, set All Temperature Magnitudes to 30. For High Frequency, set All Temperature Magnitudes to 10. For Max Frequency, set All Temperature Magnitudes to 30. Leave the Curve Shaper submenu. Leave the Precision Boost Overdrive submenu. Enter the SOC Uncore OC Mode submenu. Set SOC Uncore OC Mode to Enabled. Leave the SOC Uncore OC Mode submenu. Enter the SOC Voltage submenu. Set SOC Voltage to 1300. Then save and exit the BIOS. 
we reran the benchmarks and checked the performance increase compared to the default operation. Overclocking with asynchronous e-clock is somewhat of an academic exercise because its main purpose is to overcome the precision boost f-max limit in 1T light workload scenarios. We can see there is a small performance improvement in the single-threaded benchmark applications, but for the most part the performance is identical to when we just use Curve Optimizer. The GeoMean performance improvement is plus 7.20% and we get a maximum improvement of plus 40.59% in PY Prime. When running the OCCT CPU AVX2 stability test, the average CPU core effective clock is 5275 MHz with 1.163 volts. The average CPU temperature is 95.4 degrees Celsius. The average CPU package power is 143.6 watts. When running the OCCT CPU SSE stability test, the average CPU core effective clock is 5425 MHz with 1.254 volts. The average CPU temperature is 95.3 degrees Celsius. The average CPU package power is 143.8 watts. The boost frequency at one active thread is about 5665 MHz and the average boost frequency gradually trails off to 5,424 MHz when all cores are active. Five out of the six cores can boost beyond 5.8 GHz in single-threaded workloads. All right, let's wrap this up. This is my second Scatterventure guide for Ryzen 9000, following the Scatterventure number 78 with the 9700X. And a lot of the findings from that Scatterventure guide also translate very well into this Scatterventure guide. The overclocking process with the 9600X is very similar to that of the 9700X. We even also got to see six gigahertz with this six core CPU. Basically, it boils down to this. You want to enable precision boost overdrive to work around some of the power limitations. So you immediately unleash all the power available to the CPU and then you enable Expo. It also turns out that tuning the memory timings is pretty impactful. We saw that with the 9700X and it also applies to the 9600X. And something that also returns is that Curve Shaper really makes the asynchronous e-clock overclocking strategy viable. Without Curve Shaper, it would be a lot more difficult to use e-clock to unleash the higher frequencies. Anyway, that's it for this video. I wanna thank you for watching and the patrons for the support. If you wanna read through the BIOS settings or have a look at all of the performance results, I will also put up a written version of this video on my blog. And that's it. See you next time.